One of the biggest tragedies in the world of League of Legends esports is casual fans don't look at individual teams and judge them based on their accomplishments, but rather they judge them based on their region. This might be most prevalent with wildcard teams. In League of Legends, there's a distinction between the five main regions, or the Power Five, who are best at the game competitively, compared to all the other smaller regions scattered around the world who traditionally haven't been as good. These smaller regions are called wildcards, and they're considered simply atrocious. If a wild card is ever able to beat a Power 5 team at an international event, it's almost always viewed as that main region choking, never simply as the wild card playing well themselves. Possibly the best example of this is Albus Knox Luna, who put up an incredible performance at the 2016 World Championships. During the group stage, their group consisted of the number one seed from Korea, favorited to win the tournament overall, the number one seed from Europe, and the number two seed from North America. They made it to Worlds on a wild card spot, representing the Commonwealth of Independent States, a region of the world made up of republics formerly belonging to the Soviet Union. Now, nobody could expect them to beat any of these teams even once, but they would manage to beat all of them. Back goes in, but Kura snipes on a miracle, still tipping alive again. Nexus over Kira, trying to take down Bray, but the Nexus just a little too much for Lucid. Going for it, the hero of ANX, and it's not enough just yet. Rock still in again. All these minions are hitting the void link still. The Nexus is go. He's the greatest time. He's gonna get it. He did it. Oh my god, they did it. ANX just took down the Rocks Tigers. Let that sink in. ANX would win one game against the European team, two games against the North American team, and even one game against the top seeded Korean team to make it out of the group stage. At the time of recording this documentary, this remains the only instance of a wildcard team getting out of groups at a world championship, yet in spite of this accomplishment, most casual fans out there simply saw this as an example of the real teams choking. For a large majority of viewers, they didn't see this as Albus playing well. This was CLG, Rocks, and G2 all playing badly. You certainly could put some well-deserved criticism on those teams, but it's still unfortunate how League of Legends is one of the few sports where even if an underdog wins, that can't ever make them good in the eyes of fans. The teams they played against were all just bad, because after all, you have to be pretty bad to lose to a wild card. This mindset seems to go the other way too. Not only are bad regions viewed as having nothing but bad teams, but good regions are viewed as having nothing but the best. The two best regions in the world, China and Korea, are seen as having the cream of the crop. Whoever wins championships of those regions and then goes on to worlds must be the best of the best. Those who couldn't make it simply weren't that good, right? That's why they failed to qualify and didn't get an opportunity to test their might on the world stage. They couldn't have been good enough to deserve it. But sadly, this mentality leaves certain teams by the wayside. Teams who have built up some of the most exciting competitive rosters, who at times may have been the best in the world themselves, but who never were able to prove it when under pressure, or simply had a bit of bad luck so they never got a chance. The first instance of this was during the Season 2 circuit. Most viewers at the time thought the best team from Korea was Azubu Blaze, who along with their sister team Azubu Frost, crushed the competition throughout most Korean tournaments. But after a close 3-2 series loss to their sister team Frost in the summer playoffs, followed by another narrow 3-2 series loss to Najin Sword in the Korean regional finals, they weren't able to make it to that year's world championship and show how good they really were. Similarly, during the Season 3 Chinese League, a team called Positive Energy largely crushed all the competition they faced for the entirety of 2013. They came in second during the spring season and were crowned champions, taking home first place during the summer season leading into the World Championship but that didn't qualify them for Worlds at the time. The two Chinese representatives for Worlds that year were decided during a single regional tournament that occurred after the summer season, where the top two teams earned qualification. This tournament would sadly leave positive energy by the wayside as they were knocked out almost immediately. But this documentary is on the king of those almost mated teams, the biggest lovable losers of all time. A team who today, their name has turned into a bit of a joke, but a team of players who you could very well argue deserve the same recognition of world championship teams of the past. This is the story of KT Rolster.
If you conceivably wanted to, you could trace the story of KT all the way back to the year 1885. In this year, the Statue of Liberty was delivered to the United States, professional football was legalized in Britain, and off in Korea, a company would be founded bearing the name Korea Telegram's Hong Sun Administration. Fast forward to the year 1981, and this same company would be renamed Korea Telecom. Today, Korea Telecom, or the KT Corporation, is the largest telecommunications company in South Korea, providing landline phone service to 90% of the country, as well as internet service to about half the population. Now, in Korea, there's a fairly rich history of companies sponsoring and supporting sports teams to help promote their brands, something that will in turn give the professional athletes funding and resources that they otherwise might not have, as well as exposure for the big company's name. For instance, KT owns the KT Wiz, a baseball team competing in the Korean baseball organization the KT Shooting Team, who has won a number of gold medals at Olympics and other shooting events, as well as the KT Sonic Boom, who play in the Korean Basketball League. As popular as traditional sports are, though, not many events match the popularity and success of esports in South Korea. So naturally, KT also founded a multi-gaming organization in 1999, who today bears the name KT Rolster. Originally named the KTF Magic Ends, this was a team that solely consisted of StarCraft Brood War players meant to compete in the various star leagues of that era. KT was a big name in the country with plenty of money to throw around, so they were quickly able to gather a large number of successful superstars, the biggest of which being a player who went by the in-game name of Yellow. Yellow was considered one of the best Zerg players in the early 2000s and was highly respected, but sadly he didn't have too many titles to show for it. The only events he would take home first place in were minor tournaments. Famously, he would never win any premier Star League events, which earned him the nickname King of Silver. Oftentimes when he got second or failed to perform up to expectations, it was because of a player who would eventually turn into a very notable rival, Boxer. Boxer was a Terran player who was incredibly well respected in his own right and was one of the most innovative players in StarCraft history, but this rivalry would heat up and become especially interesting because Boxer was sponsored by another telecommunications organization known as SK Telecom. This began a rivalry that still goes on today between SKT1 and KT Rolster, known as the Telecom Wars. During those early years of the Telecom Wars, SK crushed KT more often than not, as Yellow was very rarely ever able to beat Boxer. Both players were highly respected, but this rivalry quickly devolved into one of the most lopsided that you can find across any sport, which was honestly shocking considering how talented Yellow was. These images showcase the ELO ratings of top StarCraft players in the early 2000s, and it goes to show just how highly rated Yellow was alongside Boxer. Talent-wise, there were times you could argue Yellow was the best player there was, but he, along with the rest of KT, couldn't ever translate that into a first place Star League finish. It's as though the organization was cursed. They could have all the great talent they wanted, but that talent couldn't ever finish a tournament on top. Luckily, things would turn around for the team in the latter half of the decade. Eventually, Yellow, as well as many of the other KT players, would leave the team, either due to old age forcing them into retirement, or many would be conscripted into the military. In South Korea, all male citizens between the ages of 18 and 28 are forced to perform compulsory military service, which is what happened to Yellow in 2008. But luckily for KT fans, they would get their hands on a new exciting talent, a player who the organization would pick up in 2007, who went by the name Flash. For those of you who don't know much about the history of StarCraft, Flash is often considered the best StarCraft player of all time. <laughs> Oh my god, more Lingzo are coming up right now. A group of Marines have come in. The medics continuing to heal them. Some great micro here by Flash. The Sea Jinx dealing huge amounts of damage, and Flash breaks through again. Flash is everywhere on this map right now. Hero having such there it a hard is. time. CG. Flash wins the ASL final season three. 3-1 versus Hero. 
meaning this is his third ASL victory. Yeah, the economy of Flash, by right, brother Shine, Flash hitting everywhere at once. Oh, the eraser is way too strong. So many drones falling down here. Shine's entire economy being devastated in a matter of seconds. Shine was hanging on, but all of a sudden, in a matter of seconds, Flash just hit everywhere, and it didn't seem like Shine could keep up. GG! And that is that. Flash, the two-time ASL champion, the greatest player, becomes even greater. Bonjua is a Korean title that was given to five players throughout the life of StarCraft Brood War, a title meant to distinguish them as one of the gods of the game. A player who's not just the best, but someone so dominant that they define their entire era of play. Only a handful of players have ever been good enough to earn this title. Here you can see a chart tracking their ratings alongside other top players across the years. When we make this more readable by highlighting each Bonjois career compared to the other players of their time, we can see that most of them follow a pattern. They start off a little low as they work their way up to a dominating performance before eventually trailing off and they retire. That seems to have happened to every single Bonjois, Except for Flash. Flash was almost immediately one of the best players in the world right out of the gate and remained the best for the remaining life of Brood War. His level of success truly earned him the title best of all time, and luckily for KT fans, he was theirs. Flash played for KT almost his entire career and finally earned the team some trophies to match their talent. This was an era that really solidified KT Rolster as a top organization who now had the first place finishes to back up their supposedly great talent, but as the turn of the decade rolled around, change was in the air. A new esport had emerged that was quickly sweeping the nation of Korea alongside the rest of the world, and as StarCraft was slowly dying off, this new game was there to take its place, and it exploded in popularity beyond anything we had ever seen before. In the early 2010s, League of Legends was the hot new esport taking the world by storm, and South Korea, being the country who took esports more seriously than all others, quickly picked up on the game as it replaced StarCraft as the nation's new national pastime. KT would naturally be one of the early teams to join in on the hype, as they created two sister teams to compete in the game, the KT Rolster Arrows and the KT Rolster Bullets. Sister teams may sound like an odd concept for newer League fans as they were outlawed by Riot a little while ago, but essentially the goal behind them was to have two teams under the same organization that could benefit from mutual collaboration, similarly to how the academy system works today. So that means not only could two pro teams live in the same team house, work with the same coaches, and scrimmage against each other regularly in the hopes that everyone gets better and improves at the same time, but the two teams could also do things like shuffle their rosters around a little bit, trade players, swap them out, and see if they could find the best possible combination of five guys for each team who synergize perfectly with each other. The difference between KT Rolster A and KT Rolster B back in the day was kind of interesting as each of these separate teams approached playing League of Legends differently, but most fans would agree that the better of the two teams were the Bullets. As summed up nicely by Monte Cristo in a 2017 interview with Blitz Esports, maybe they didn't have all the best players, maybe they didn't have all the stars, but they did have excellent planning, excellent macro, and excellent execution of strange strategies. The Bullets were the team who were best at being creative with their tactics, and although having a slightly worse talent pool compared to some of the other top teams out there if compared on raw skill alone, they used innovative strategies to make up for that skill differential, and even then they did still have some superstar talent who could pull off some exciting mechanical plays as well, all of which combined garnering them a huge amount of hype and dedicated fans in those early years. Maybe one of the most famous examples of one of their legendary mechanical players would probably have to be Insec, who was the team's jungler and top laner in 2013 and 2014. He invented a particularly exciting way to play the jungler Lee Sin that almost everyone uses today. Lee Sin's ultimate is an ability that on its own damages opponents and knocks them back away from Lee himself. The damage is pretty nice and it can be a useful way to help your team disengage if you have to get away from your opponent and run away 
way, but Insect found an even better way to use the ability. If you use some of Lee's other abilities alongside a ward to position yourself behind your opponent very quickly, then you can knock an enemy towards your team, being even more useful and giving Lee an even more dynamic playstyle where he can be used defensively or aggressively when fighting. Again, this is something that pretty much every Lee Sin player does nowadays, but Insect was the first to do it, inventing a technique that got a lot of people excited to do things like look up KT highlights whenever they could. It took a little while for the Bullets to come into their own and become a top team in Korea, but they would quickly become the face of the KT organization and form the core of the team when the two sister teams merged under one name. They had players with huge potential and crazy levels of skill like Ryu, Score, Sumde, Kakao, Insec, and Nagne, almost all of which who are players that are still playing Lee competitively today, seven years later. The KT Bullets really developed some of the game's top talent we would see for years to come. But we do have to talk about the Arrows for a moment because of one big event they competed in. So while Monte Cristo described the Bullets as a strategic and innovative team in that interview, he also spent a few seconds describing the KT Rolster Arrows, but simply called them a hot mess of chaos, which is exactly what they were. Change immediately, Sunday is right there though. No idea, Sunday getting caught, taking down the stun from Andy, helping. There's the flash, there's the Lulu shield. Can he get away? Two flashes, he's rookie with the command protect. Amazing play from KT to keep him alive. Whoa, that was good. Kakao over the wall. Oh, Kakao gets caught a little bit. Another command protect. Someday coming back to lane. What are you doing? Someday may have given this one up. No bang. Gets They're a little bit still too close fighting. To the this is insane. This is level one, I guess now. Oh man, it's a new head. He's got no man on it. Yeah, I know. Just trying to auto him under turret. Does he have one more command attack, maybe? Oh, he misses it. There's a barrier. Martin gets the by Kakao. They know how good he is. He comes in. Tries to get a little bit too late. Nice timing for the snipe for Oro. Oh, we got the kill. We got the kill. One roster the Arrows came up with during the 2014 OGN Summer Split was a thing of strange, twisted beauty. This included Sumde and Kakao, who were swapped over from the Bullets, some younger players named Arrow and Hachani in the bot lane, coupled with a promising young mid laner named Rookie, and yes, that is the same rookie who just carried Invictus Gaming to a world championship in 2018. Every single one of these players on the Arrows were just teenagers at the time, 16, 17, 18 years old. Nobody expected them to amount to much since naturally they were super underdeveloped as league competitors. They didn't have very clean play, they didn't have sound strategies, and their execution left a lot to be desired. But in this 2014 summer split, to everyone's surprise, the Bullets fell out of the group stage, and it was the KT Arrows who made it into the tournament bracket alone. And then something really weird happened with them. They won! After squeaking past Najin Shield in a narrow three games to two victory, suddenly the Arrows were further than they had ever been before in a Korean playoff. They hadn't ever made the semifinals. They were in uncharted territory. Now, they had to face off against SK Telecom T1S. This was a daunting task. SK had never lost to KT in bracket. Here in League's early years, it looked like it was going to be a repeat of everything that happened in Brood War. SK dominating the Telecom War rivalry, winning champions while KT always came up second. And this T1S roster, coached by K Koma and built around Easy Hoon, should have no problem dealing with the KT arrows. But then they won. Again, three games to two, twice in a row now, the KT Arrows and their hot mess of gameplay had squeaked into the finals. This was just shocking. What the hell was happening? How is this the KT team that is now repping the org and now having to go up against Samsung Galaxy Blue? Yes, that's Samsung, the company that made your phone and your fridge and your dishwasher. Samsung Blue were currently coming into the finals after beating their own sister team and they were the defending OGN champions from the previous spring split. Their sister team that year would go on to win the world championship and they were looking like an incredibly dominating organization. It's absurd to think that the Arrows would even have a chance against them, but I think you can see where this is going. <laughs> Oh, 
아웃습니다. 골키블로 받아치죠. 에이코 먼저 길어지죠. 예, 이분이 죽고요. 자, 다리를 날리고요. 자, 이거 다리 위험합니다. 위험해요, 위험해요, 위험해요. I honestly have no idea how they did this. Three straight, three to two sets where they would narrowly beat Najin Shield, their rivals, SKT, and Samsung Blue one after another. This is just ridiculous. Look at this bracket. On the one side, you have Samsung Blue taking care of business, looking stronger than ever. 3-0 sweeping Jin Air, almost sweeping their sister team who goes on to win Worlds, carrying all the momentum as defending OGN champions. Well, KT just narrowly squeaks by on their way to a championship. No big deal. This ridiculous, majestic tournament series was a work of strange and beautiful art. These games were fun as hell to watch, and I'm sure they were a joyous occasion for KT fans to remember. But sadly, this is not what KT's early League of Legends rosters are remembered for. No, it wasn't this finals that defined their early years. It was a previous OGN championship that virtually everyone still remembers today. Let's rewind the clock to the year 2013. This was the first year that League really began taking off in Korea, and it was the first year that KT Rolster started finding success. During the winter and spring seasons, the Bullets in particular would put up some fairly respectable performances and establish themselves as one of the better, more exciting teams in the entire Korean League. They were certainly better than their sister team, the Arrows, so most KT fans looked to them to bring home something to be proud of don't just be the kings of silver. It was the summer split where everything would finally click and they would make a run for the title. After getting out of their group stage without too much trouble, their first opponents were CJ Blaze, a team consisting of legendary players, Flame, Lustboy, Captain Jack, Ambition, and Helios, all names that veteran league fans will remember well, but they would beat them, three games to two. Next up, they had the Mad Life-led CJ Frost, who very nearly won that world championship the previous year, and they destroyed them three games to zero. The only team standing in the bullet's way of a championship was none other than their rivals, SK Telecom T1-2. This was a team that, like KT, had never won anything before. They only managed to qualify for OGN that previous spring. They got third place in their first split, but didn't really have an impressive resume. It was a team made up of mostly young rookies at the time, Piglet, Humandu, Bengi, Impact, and a very young, budding mid laner named Faker. Little did either team know, but this series would become a watershed moment for both organizations, as the results largely predicted the future direction that both teams would end up going in. Whoever won, it would be their first Korean championship, their first major victory in the League of Legends era of the Telecom Wars, and it was one hell of a close series. And they're waiting, there's a snowball on the bot, but will they get it? Will this be first blood? It will be, but it will be for score. They trade. But it's gonna be a jungle breaker. Oh, a double kill for score! A huge beginning for him. Piglet having to use his ultimate to get away. Everybody gets out. They get the kill, but they're, they may Oh, oh what, what a shot! shot. What a true shot barrage from score! No, they do get Ryu, but here we go. Now, Insect coming in to try to engage Impact from the top with that slicing Maelstrom. A huge three-man shockwave. Piglet on the outside doing a lot of damage. And oh my gosh, has SK held? No, despite another double kill from Piglet, it's just not quite enough. A triple kill for score. A quadra kill for score, and that is it. Game over. Needs to be careful. Gets Does killed by Piglet. a super minion, actually, and that'll be it. That is definitely it. There goes the Nexus. GG. KT had hit the ground running, taking a convincing 2 to nothing lead in the best of five. Things were looking bright as the bullets were playing well, but surprisingly, this didn't seem to phase SK all that much, and they didn't quit. Piglet's in a little bit of trouble. There's a whimsy on the Piglet. He's getting low. 
There's the barrier. He does pop it. Score gets popped up into the air with the ultimate. They're going to go ahead and trade. So far, Mafa very low. A double kill for Piglet on top of all of it. And that, oh, Lulu. If they can get Zack out of the way, and they do, what a huge move. Suddenly, the support's in a bit of trouble. Ryu gets taken down. This is SKT's fight. Goodbye, score. Double kill for Faker. There goes the Nexus, and we are going to game five. SK had managed to tie the series two games to two, which back in those days sent the game into a blind pick game five. Blind pick meaning that while normally in a usual champion select phase, teams will pick and ban characters in order, so no more than one champion will be in game at a time, now there were no bans and a free for all. Anyone can pick anything, even if that results in a mirror matchup. Here the two mid laners for both sides, Ryu and Faker, would both lock in Zed, and SKT would really start pulling ahead. Being a hit from the vision of Faker there for just a moment. First tower goes down in that bottom lane in favor of KT Bullets. And look at this, Ryu gets oh. the ignite laid down on him. Yep, he does it. There's a death mark going in. Death mark on both of them. Stand United coming in on the Faker. Impact there. Ryu trying to get away. Flashes out of the taunt. The Ignite going down though from Impact this time. Double Ignite! So. That's the real key. Oh, Cacao getting completely caught. Body slam into Death Mark. And a Death Mark's not an easy thing to live with. KT's chances of winning were disappearing fast. All hope had evaporated from the team. And then, as if to rub salt in the wound, the most famous outplay in League of Legends history occurred right there and then. Like, even though I only have a mat on the floor, I think he's in the bed. Oh, Faker may be in trouble here. Death Mark tries to clean it up for Ryu. Oh, look at the cleanse. Look at the moves. Faker, what was that? After winning their first Korean championship, that same SK Telecom roster would go on to beat the Bullets again in the regional finals. This meant that neither KT team would qualify for Worlds that year. They would have to sit at home as they went on to see their rivals, SK Telecom, go on to win Korea's first world championship. The following year was the miracle year the Arrows were able to make that run to win the Korean final for KT's first championship. But even in that bright and exciting moment for KT fans, 2014 still had an overarching feeling of sadness. That same year, both of KT's teams, the Arrows and Bullets, would again fail to qualify for the world championship as Samsung would be the dominant force winning in 2014. But as the season came to a close, an interesting development occurred. Top Korean players were being bought out by other regions. It was called the Great Korean Exodus, where most of the region's top talent would leave to go to China, Europe, and North America. As much as Korea was infatuated with esports, this year North America and China in particular began seeing big money getting invested into League of Legends teams. Korea's financial situation paled in comparison, and when million dollar offers were being thrown at some of the top Korean players, the local Korean teams either couldn't or maybe simply didn't match them, meaning most of their top players would leave the region. The peak of this exodus culminated when every single player from the world champion Samsung team were bought out by various Chinese organizations as they all left to play for various teams across the Yellow Sea. Although some of the best Korean players still remain, such as Faker, who stayed with SK Telecom, this presented a new opportunity. A huge amount of competition had vanished, leaving a bit of a power vacuum. Around this time is also when Riot Games banned the use of sister teams across all regions, so most of the Korean organizations had to merge all of their players into one big super team. The merging of KT's two rosters had some growing pains and left them with a fairly mediocre finish in the spring season, but when summer came around, around, suddenly they were looking incredible. KT had kept almost all of their top talent, only losing Insect to the Exodus as he would go off to China. Other than that, they remained together and their roster was beginning to work really well, showing their potential. With a chance at a new team taking the number one spot in Korea and possibly the world, KT had an enormous opportunity ahead of them. That summer split, they would go on to beat nearly every single team in the regular season, qualifying them for playoffs, and after miraculously beating the Koo Tigers, one of the best new up-and-coming Korean teams, they would be placed into the finals to face off against their old rivals SK Telecom T1. 
This was a beautiful chance at redemption. See what the assault of battery pushes people away with that Empress of I. Very patient use on that one. Goodbye, Nogne. A kill for Marn and Bang. Untouched in the back. Going after everyone. Goodbye, Pickaboo. A double kill for Marin. Wolf trying to find more plays to make. Someday finally it's Meganar right before he's taken out by Baker. And it looks like this is going to be an ace. And this is almost certainly going to be the final nail in the coffin for KT Rolster. Can KT keep their players alive? It's going to be tough. Arrow coming from the side. Now he's got a lot of health. And wow, this is low. Bang takes out Victor. Pickaboo. Bang, can he get him as well? Or Bangy trying to take him out. Wolf gets a bloodthirsty kill. And meanwhile, Pickaboo goes down as well. And SKT turns that Faker first blood into more. They're going to dive score as well. It's an ace for KT. Only Nogne score and Sunday remaining and Nogne burning down. He'll get taken out by Wolf's Ignite. He's going for the next one. They're delaying it. And Bang is going to win. Champion Summer for his team, SK Telecom. 3-0 in the spring season. 3-0 in the summer season. This is the year of SKT. At this point, fans began to wonder if KT Rolster was simply cursed. It was around here that a joke began forming surrounding KT don't get excited. The moment you get excited about a roster that KT puts together, that's when they'll choke, lose, and let you down. That year, we did have one slightly nice upside for the team. KT would end up qualifying for their first world championship. They managed to make it out of the group stage at Worlds fairly easily as well, but then they would have to face off against Koo Tigers in the first round of the bracket, this time, they would fall to the Tigers, losing a not particularly close three game to one set. That same Worlds, KT would have to sit and watch as their rivals, SK Telecom, went on to win their second World Championship. ...has to run away from his base. SK Telecom looking to take down the final Nexus turrets. It does not look good for Kuro and his team. Ku Tigers are falling. SKT will be your first ever two-time World Champions! SK Telecom T1, your two-time world champions. In the 2016 season, things would continue spiraling downhill for the KT organization, at least in the early parts of the year. KT would actually manage to beat SK during the spring season and finish ahead of them in the standings, but when playoffs rolled around, SK swept them 3-0 again. It was beginning to feel like this KT Rolster team was just cursed to be no different than Yellow during his time on KT. Both iterations of KT Rolster were filled with incredibly talented players, possibly being the most skilled players of anyone in the world at times, yet whenever people got excited for a big tournament or event where there might be a chance for them taking home a crown, KT would always choke. Not only were they struggling to take home first place, but at this point KT could hardly deal with their rivals anymore. I mean, SK Telecom had won two world championships now, whereas KT only even qualified for one. Even if you just want to talk about the rivalry in terms of how well they played versus each other head-to-head -head in the Telecom Wars, things were just as ugly, if not worse. At this point, SKT had a 20-game to 6 advantage over KT Rolster in the Telecom Wars during the League of Legends era. Now, that includes all of the individual games played between the two, but they were almost always in best of two, best of three, or best of five sets. If you want to just tally who won the sets themselves, SKT had won eight sets, they tied once back when you could still tie in the Korean League, and KT had only won a single set in the 2016 spring regular season. As heated as this rivalry had been hyped up previously, it had turned into one of the most one-sided affairs we've ever seen in League, but KT would finally be able to throw this monkey off their back pretty soon. During the 2016 summer split of LCK, things were starting off similarly to how they looked in previous years. KT had an exciting roster that was filled to the brim with potential, finishing top three at the end of the regular season. However, like those seasons of old, they couldn't deal with their rivals SK Telecom and finished underneath them in the standings after losing both sets they played. During playoffs though, KT looked determined to not let history repeat itself. They beat Samsung Galaxy three games to nothing to make it into the next round where they would face off against their old rivals. How did things start? Well, not very good. They would fall down two games to nothing early on in the series, looking at a dismal situation 
but they weren't about to let their rivals sweep them this time around. AT is going to try on some Duke as well. Score looking for it. Flash away from Duke with the flash onto him with the Unboro is there for score. And that will be first blood coming through for KT. Going to try to get some vision. Score comes into the back through the magical journey. They're going to be looking for it. Blank goes for it. He's going to get locked down. The W coming in. He knocks him away with the explosive cast. But Wolf already falls. Blank goes down as well. Two kills picked up for KT. Get KT, but one ace for SKT. The ability to team by can't be denied. Oh, well, they go in on the Sunday score, jumps into the back line, looking Killed for Baker, and he's going to be able to kill him. Indeed, Sunday goes in, ults back flank. Could have died. Score's taking a hell of a lot of damage from Baker. The Cassio is still doing some relevant uh, damage. Uh, Animal eyes are down. Baker, he had popped up. Nice on Burrow from score. They take him down. Fly finds the kill, and Curtin Gall opened up. They want to give that one over to Arrow, unable to do it. As score, good problems. He just does too much damage. Without fly, he's going to take a bunch of damage. Might have to use the frozen tube down onto himself. Curtin Gall. Through, looking for the shots, and Blank's going to be the first one in the fight to go down. Fly does drop the first two onto him. Duke arrives. He's going low. Can't even snap back with the ultimate. He just falls as Hachani finishes him off. How many is it going to be? Someday on the chase here for Baker. Wolf running down as the rest of KT tries to get onto him. The boulder will connect, and someday he's going to keep going as the ultimate. Gets the wall up onto Baker. He's looking for the kill. Hachani coming around the side. The Dazzle's going to connect, and someday comes up with a basically solo kill, and three members of SKT go down off of a blue buff in me. Score coming in deep though, gets exhausted out by Wolf. Blank getting locked up, the Dazzle not going to connect, but it does. Someday! The bundle, and there it comes, Someday! Arrow getting a big bomb of damage in on the Blank, a double kill coming through as he's able to finish off Bang and SKT are just running for the hills. Snap back from Duke as he's trying to stick into the back line. They're, they're on the Arrow, Nexus! They're on the Nexus and KT Rolster! They're going to do it! They take down SK Telecom in the reverse sweep, bringing it back three games in a row, and they are going to the finals on the 20th to face against the Rockstar. KT had finally found a way to beat SK Telecom and in really crazy fashion, reverse sweeping their rivals all those years after getting reverse swept themselves in the 2013 finals must have felt incredible. Unfortunately for their fans, in true KT style, they would lose a close three games to two set against the Rocks Tigers in the grand finals that year. And then they lost a close three games to two set against Samsung in the regional qualifiers. Meaning, yet again, they would not be attending a world championship due to losing these incredibly close sets. Even in this year of triumph for KT, they couldn't take home a title or make it to Worlds. And of course that year, yet again, KT had to watch their rivals go home to take their third world championship, as SKT would be the first team to successfully defend a title winning back-to-back -back Worlds. I don't know if there's another team in the history of esports as tortured as KT Rolster. In the offseason leading up to 2017, KT had seemingly had enough. They wanted to climb back on top of the rivalry against SKT. They wanted to take home a title rather than getting stuck with the nickname Kings of Silver again. And in that offseason, they would go out and grab some of the best talent in free agency, creating one of the best super teams we've ever seen on paper. Their longtime jungler, Score, would remain as an anchor point for the roster to build around, but they would sign Deft and Mata to play down bot lane, a pairing who had played on old Samsung teams winning LCK once themselves before going off to win titles in the Chinese League. Mid lane, they would sign Pawn, who similarly had been winning titles off in China after he himself won the 2014 World Championship with Samsung White. Last but not least, KT would manage to snag Smeb, who at the time was the most exciting top laner in the world after having previously won an LCK championship with the Rocks Tigers and even coming second at a world championship only losing to SKT. This was the most exciting roster KT had ever assembled. There hadn't ever been a super team of this magnitude created before in league, and the talent was unmatched by any other organization in the world. There were a few growing pains in the early parts of the split, as there usually are with a new roster, but they finished the season strong and were looking amazing going into playoffs. They swept MVP three to nothing. They swept Samsung three to nothing. They were in the finals, again, looking incredible. But that led to the fateful error of their fans getting excited about KT. Looking fantastic, but he still has not 
caught down the wild card. Keep him alive and caught. Goes into that token tower. Goes, but Baker is right on top of him. Picks it up. Going into the back line. Trying to finish off Mana. He's able to get it. Now looking for Smeb. He flashes over the wall. Towards the crook of Baker. Hot on his heels. Goes over with the playful trick. Trying to finish off the chain. Will get traded back to PT. Starting to kind with depth. Won't be able to do so. Gets locked up. Gets taken down. That's three kills. Over to SKT. Only losing the fit. Pop up. Goes down on the team. Trying to keep himself alive, and it's not going to happen. Peter puts another one on the board. 6-1-4 and four now. With the scrapes flashing it, and the line comes down. Collateral damage. Connects in on the net, but it's not going to do it up. He's, he's not down. done. He's not done yet. The Ash Arrow coming through. Yeah, that's a monster. Nowhere to go. Takes him out another way. Telecom in the meantime. They've done it. Less than 30 minutes on the clock. They take down the Nexus. They take down KT Rolster. They put another championship title on their belt. SKT G1 will be going to MSI. Welcome to your new world overload. Same as the last overlords is SK Telecom G1. With possibly the best roster they had ever assembled, KT would lose 0-3 to against their rivals SKT in the spring playoffs and getting yet another second place. They would fail in summer as well, getting knocked out by SKT three games to two, and because this is KT Rolster, of course they're going to go and get 3-0'd, knocked out by Samsung Galaxy in the Korean Regional Finals, a Samsung team who would then go on to win that year's World Championship. As I read this script back to myself, it's only now hitting me what these players must have been feeling. Score, the jungler for KT in particular, he had been with the team since 2012, playing with them for nearly six straight years. I mean, he's an incredibly talented jungler, some consider him the best jungler in league's history, and while he's had plenty of top three finishes now with KT to show for it, he had never gotten first. Players come and go from a team normally, and if there's some sort of loyalty like this, it's typically because you have success playing together. I honestly can't believe that Score didn't just up and leave for a better team at this time. It's incredible a player is even able to play at that high of a level for so long, and esports careers don't last that long. They're not supposed to last that long, but Score never quit. He's still playing for KT today at the time of recording this. That level of perseverance is honestly incredible, and eventually it would pay off. At the start of the 2018 spring season, change had begun to sweep the LCK for the first time in ages. New teams with young superstars like the Afrika Freaks and Kingzone Dragon X had won promotion into the league and were now topping the standings. Old established powerhouses like SK Telecom were beginning to struggle, and for once, KT finally looked like they might be able to win a championship themselves. They would finish above SK Telecom in the standings, and when they faced them in playoffs, they handled them with ease. This time around, Score actually gets know. himself in here, and Bro is yelled out from Score. Loads of damage as he's one level ahead, lands the undertow after the flash, and now a couple more. He's just holding onto it, doesn't even need it. First block goes to Score in the jungle. And KT Rolster, they've done it. It's the 3-1 victory in the Telecom War of the playoffs, and they're heading to round two. KT Rolster eliminate SK Telecom. They would fall to the upstart of Freak of Freaks in the following round, but things were looking good for them, particularly because things were looking so bad for their rivals. The next split, 2018 summer, SK Telecom would miss out on playoffs entirely for the first time in their team's history, and this would end up becoming one of the most competitive splits Korea had ever seen. Four separate teams would all tie with the same record for first place, and due to tiebreakers, KT would finally get to come out first. This was the first time in their history they finished first overall in a regular season. This would seed them directly into the finals for playoffs, where they would face off against Griffin, one of the new upstart teams that was dominating the LCK that year after just winning promotion into the league. And KT played one of the closest grand finals you will ever see. Spot lane, the court, yeah, great the has to flash very quickly, but Mata flashes on top of him. They really want first blood over here for Dev. The ultimate flies down the hands, no more mobility available. And there's not a lot of damage, but he still should get taken out. The Zap not going to connect. Mata looking for Viper. Smep teleported in. First blood does go over to Mata, but the double kill comes in as Smep picks up the next one and survives. Yeah, so much goes. damage. Ornhorn comes in, and it might just be a free kill going over as Smep. Looking for more, comes over the side as Lahens takes down Yukal, but now Def 
starts off in this fight and Score is doing so much damage to Sword. Smeb right here in this fight, but remember, Deft is still alive. The Q lands Viper. He's the first to go down as Trovi. Does have to be respected. Deft is able to take him down, though Tarzan falls as well. Sword just says, okay, have fun in the team fight, boys. I'm gonna win, but no, it's Smeb that makes it home. Now, KT, they're a man down in the fight, but Trovi should get taken out. It's going to be Yukal that grabs that kill. This fight continues. Oh, the stopwatch in the little mini video, can but it's not game? enough. I think He's can. looking to try and get the damage. No one can actually back in time score. Can he get there? He's, He's running as fast as he can, but I don't think he'll make oh, it. Oh, he got it! And they save it, but not he enough. Lost Sword and Lahens. Lahens did eventually die, guys. You need to stop the minion wave from pushing. When do you all in? When do you give your life to delay? Well, I mean, how much do they actually have available to them because Mata and Score aren't exactly the damage dealers, and look at how quickly these turrets are going down. Banshee's Veil is popped here from Viper, who takes a lot of damage with Smeb. He's going to be here. Is he actually able to do it? Viper goes down, and KT, they may have found their opportunity. Tarzan, can he get this Nexus turret? It's a huge deal, but Def says no. There's poise, there's experience, and there's knowing what to do in the ultra late game. You don't scrim for this, and if they kill Chovy, it's guaranteed, and if they waste his time, maybe they win oh, anyway. That was a face check, and Yukal managed to get Casey the pick. Casey, you've done it. Casey, you're going to win. Just ridiculous. They've got an open Nexus to run out here. Well, Smeb may have actually opened this one up for Griffin, but that is not the case. Heroic Entrance comes in just to break open the base here. It's Toby taken down by Dev. The flash forward, the Feather Storm, the Inhibitor going to go down, and Sword thought he was flanking, but he's not. He's getting taken down by Smeb. Trying to play with the base gates, but Lahens once again going to fall. Viper, can he play this team fight out? As there's the paranoia, and the GA is once again going to be Pop KT just playing as a unit. And Sword has the GA go down, but Deft is going to take him out in the end. Inhibitor, the next target is Viper. Full health, but can't find his way in. And KT, they break over the, the game. Viper now getting taken down to half health. Smeps the Ergon has the disdain, has the ultimate, and the fear beyond death gets rid of both of the carries. And KT are now fighting as if they're on the red side. It's Sword going down so low. Dev has so much goddamn damage. And Smeb will deal with Tarzan with the help of Marta. And Griffin just fall apart. It's KT Rolster until the end. Yukal tanking the turrets as KT haven't lost a member. The last Nexus turret and the storyline for Score is completed. They're already off their seats. Game five, Papa Smitty. And Score has done it, not second anymore. It's first place. And the KT fairy tale is finally alive. Finally, for the first time since summer of 2014 with the KT Rolster Arrows, KT had won the Korean League. For the first time in his illustrious career, Score was crowned a champion of a tournament, and for once, KT got to prove that they were the best team in Korea. The victory had to be short-lived though, since their win meant that KT had the number one seed from Korea headed into the World Championship for 2018. At that Worlds, they hoped to replicate their success from the year and would get out of group stage fairly easily, only dropping a single game. This seeded them against Invictus Gaming, the number two Chinese seed. These two teams were a little unfortunate to face each other at this point in the tournament. They were the best two teams in the tournament and whoever won this series was likely gonna cruise on their way to winning a world championship. Whoever could come out on top in this quarterfinal best of five. And in true KT fashion, this series would give their fans heart palpitations as it was nail bitingly close. It started off with Invictus Gaming going up two games to nothing early on, but then KT came rolling back, tying the series two games to two. All they needed was one win, and KT would be favorites to win the World Championship. Just one win. But sadly, it is still KT Rolster we're talking about. Shy's still gonna be soaking. Root comes down, damage goes through. Jackie's able to find two. Jackie Love! Kills. Jackie Love just found everybody, and that's gonna be a triple for IG. They're gonna find everyone. It's KT Ace! I'm stunned up, juggle back, seismic shove, right back to the line, the KT Rolster. They're able to 
find a massive fear. Shy's gonna be taken down. Balon's gonna be frontlining now. Shy trying to find the passive damage. Score looks to get himself away. Goes into the stage to keep himself alive for now. Trying to get back. Mata also gonna be barely living now. Side for Joe looking for Jackie Love. Can't quite find it. It's Jackie grabbing the kill on his map. It's Jackie looking to find the kill to Yukal. It's Jackie who can't quite get him. And KT hobbles away. It's gonna be Jackie Love eating some shots from death, but Score looks to get himself away. Yeah. Ming finds the auto attack and Score is gone. This should be it. Ming's able to grab that kill and that means the fight continues even further forward. See if they can find something else. It's Lamb to Spike giving Invictus Gaming topped off. They're gonna be just fine. Death really gets got it. away. Rookie's got the chain. KT Rolster have fallen and Invictus Gaming will do what has not been done since 2014. They will eliminate the Korean first seed and they will move on to the semifinals. IG would then go on to win Worlds, leaving KT fans wondering for the millionth time what could have been. It's honestly astounding, looking back on their history, just how close KT has come to greatness so many times. So many times where they could have won champions in Korea, so many times where they could have won LCK, so many times where they could have made it to Worlds, and if only they made it one of those years, so many times where they could be the Korean team to win it all. In the National Football League, there's a team called the Buffalo Bills, and ever since the turn of the century, they have been known as one of the worst teams in American football. Most recently, the Bills were known as the team who had an 18-year-long playoff drought, 18 years of playing so poorly they were never able to even make it to a postseason game, much less win a playoff game. They've had a grand total of three years with winning records since the turn of the century. They've had 10 different coaches who were hired over those years to try and fix the team. But what they might be most known for is the 1990 to 1993 run where they made four consecutive Super Bowls and lost every single one. Most teams who make a high number of Super Bowls have some level of success, which is why they're able to consistently get there so many times, like the Green Bay Packers, who have made five Super Bowls and were able to win four of them. Many teams have only ever made one or two, but they were still able to snag a win anyway. It's a cruel and unusual punishment for the city of Buffalo to have a team that can make that many Super Bowls and not come away with a single championship, doing it four years in a row, no less. Needless to say, they have been the butt end of the joke of football fans for years and years ever since. But then people recognized after a while, holy moly, these were good teams. A team who was able to make four consecutive championship games, that's an incredible feat. No NFL team has ever been able to make it to four consecutive Super Bowls before or since. The closest any team has ever come is the current Bill Belichick New England Patriots. They've made the past three Super Bowls, They'd still have to do it though one more time this upcoming year just to tie the Bills record. It's a pretty funny statement to say that the dominant New England Patriots are now almost as good as the Buffalo Bills. Even with the losses in the championship game, it's an insane accomplishment to be one of the top two NFL teams four years in a row, and realistically, they were probably the best team in the world plenty of those years. I mean, just because they had one coin flip play or another that didn't fall their way in those games, that doesn't mean that their talent doesn't deserve recognition. And recognition is eventually what they got. Eight of their players from those teams are now in the Hall of Fame. A few of their staff and players would go on to win championships with other teams as well. And the city of Buffalo still loved them incredibly dearly for all those great performances they put on. I would make an argument that KT Rolster are the Buffalo Bills of League of Legends. Throughout their history across multiple games, they have been known for one thing, second place. Whether it be in StarCraft, League of Legends, maybe it's losing to their rivals or wasting the potential of their great rosters, or maybe simply coming up one game short, a game short of an LCK title, a game short of a world championship, KT has just always been synonymous with disappointment. But you know what? Even if they're a team who doesn't have an impressive trophy case, they sure as hell have an impressive resume. To date, KT Rolster has played in 20 total LCK regular seasons, playoff series, and Korean regional finals since they merged sister teams. They finished first overall a total of three times, securing second place eight separate times, and earned the bronze medal on seven different occasions. 
That means of the 20 Korean competitions they entered, KT Rolster finished top three in 18 of them. 18 times out of 20, they finished as one of the three best teams in the best region in the world. At the time of recording this documentary, KT Rolster are at the bottom of the Korean League. They just looked like one of the worst teams in Korea in this past spring split and have had to play through a relegation series just to even remain in the LCK. They managed to win and are still hanging around, Score still with the team trying as hard as he can to bring them a little more greatness. That may never happen again. KT may just be doomed to disappointment and may one day eventually be relegated, may disband, and just disappear. But throughout the eras they competed in, they sure as hell played some beautiful League of Legends. Hey, thanks so much for watching my documentary. If you enjoyed it and would like to see more, I have a number of others on my YouTube channel here. If you'd like to see more regular content that doesn't come out with such long gaps between it, I also have a second channel where I post regular esports opinionated videos discussing various things that are going on within the industry. I am working on more documentaries though and hopefully getting them out at a more reasonable pace in the future so you can of course subscribe for more. But whenever I see you next, thank you very much for watching. Good luck in solo queue and have a wonderful day.